Welcome to Wellraiser Radio. I'm your host, Joshua Coburn, and with me, as always, sensational Shane Scala. Ew, stop. <laughs> That's kind of gross. Hello, it is gross. It's gross. <laughs> nice, to, it's, nice to see you. It's awesome. And uh, we also have Simon All Smiles <laughs> Sanborn. Nice. Uh, yes. I appreciate that so much. Thank it's, you. It's what I do. That's what you do. <laughs> it is. You bring the joy. Uh, you bring the joy. I, I bring the joy. Wow. Yeah. That makes me feel gross as well. Uh. <laughs> uh, today's guest is Justin the Big Pygmy Wren. Uh, he's an author, activist, and Bellator MMA fighter, uh, former USC fighter, Ultimate Fighter TV show participant. But anyway, he stopped fighting to help these oppressed people who are being held as slaves. They're being raped, murdered, and no joke, eaten right. seriously which which he mentions during this show like in it's tense. crazy it is absolutely yeah crazy it's like kind of oh record. you know what i i'm gonna go ahead and quit my american dream i'm gonna fly to a place where people are being eaten i'm gonna help them that takes some guts walking the lion's den man absolutely mm-hmm. and justin does it so thanks again for tuning in to well raised radio it starts right friggin now check it out justin welcome to well raiser radio Hey, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. It's totally our pleasure. And, and <laughs> yeah, sorry about the reschedules previously. It's, it's so awesome to have you on. But just to... Yeah, uh, I'm excited. Yeah, awesome. Just, just to dive right in here, because I'm not going to lie, I'm really pumped about kind of covering a ton of cool stuff. But like from reading through everything, you knew you wanted to be like fight, a fighter or mixed martial artist at like, what, like 13, according to my notes. Like, how does one yeah. know that? that young like how did it click for you <laughs> uh well I, at, I guess at first i started saving up my allowance to get a uh, a bb gun at a local uh <laughs> flea market that makes and sense i got there and on the way to the spot where they're selling bb guns there's a used video store and whenever i went inside uh they had all the vhs tapes everywhere and one little section had ufc two through nine or two through ten um, and I ended up spending all the money I was going to get the BB gun with on UFC. And, uh, so I just, um, I looked at the v- VHS tapes and I remember looking at the front you see boxer versus karate and sumo versus taekwondo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu versus wrestling. And I just fell in love with the sport, uh, right then and there, because to me it was multiple sports coming into one sport. And so it wasn't just having to think one, two, three things. It's having to think four, five, six sports all at the same time. Nice. So for me, it's the closest thing to a human chess match. So That's I just fell in love with it on that end. And then on the other end, uh, I had been struggling and going through uh, some some tough times at that young age, um, kind of from third grade through 10th grade. But really, the height of it was sixth grade through eighth grade. Um, I, I dealt with bullying a lot, uh, getting bullied, not being the bully, even though I'm a fighter now, um, I, I got bullied. And then whenever I picked up those VHS tapes and looking at the back and seeing those guys that were disciplined and martial artists, and also a lot of them were chiseled and strong. I still haven't gotten to that part, uh, <laughs> but they, uh, they, they just probably didn't get bullied. So I loved that aspect too. Wow, nice. I mean, and and I never thought of like mixed martial arts as kind of like that was that scene from uh, was it Rocky Four with Thunderlips and Hulk Hogan and, and Rocky throwing down? Like you guys remember that? Like Thunderlips. The, yeah, you remember? It with the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so going back to the to the bullying a little bit. I mean, yeah. When when it comes down to that, was I mean did you start kind of using those moves on dudes at school or did, were you just kind of reserved? How what was your mindset then? Uh, no, I, I mean, I didn't start, uh, pursuing it at all until two years later, whenever I was 15 years old, you guys being in Iowa, um, I, I didn't have the luxury of having, uh, uh, wrestling around me at all times growing up and everything else and being farm boy strong. Uh, <laughs> our, you know, Texas was football. Right. And so um, whenever I got into high school, though, there was one coach. He had some kids in the middle school and he had come and watched uh, me play high school uh, football. And so he said, I bet you'd be a pretty good wrestler. And I just I had my head on a swivel looking for a way to get involved in MMA. Told my mom I wanted to try out boxing. She was like, no way. 
but whenever I brought wrestling to her, she was a little more open to that. And so uh, wrestling was my foot in the door and how I started to pursue uh, MMA, even at 15 years old. Now, Justin, you're, you know, being bullied is not a new story. It's not something that's shocking to a lot yeah. of people. There's a lot of people who get bullied. Were you thinking of suicidal thoughts at, at, a, at a super early age? Yeah, probably 11, 12 years old when I first started having those thoughts. But um, it bullies started escalating. Um, in sixth grade, I, I, third through sixth at my elementary school, you know, it was a, a lot smaller of a number. You know, four or five or six elementary schools came together for middle school. And so then the ones that, that had been bullying me, they found other bullies. And then they were able to bully me even more in wow. uh, middle school. And so it was, it was in middle school that I remember, uh, truly, um, becoming suicidal and it being a, a daily, uh, battle, at least depression without a doubt was at 13 years old. I was clinically diagnosed with depression. Um, and the kids could just be relentless and, uh, and we, we've all dealt with bullying, but, but mine, um, I don't know it. I opened up about it one time on one podcast and it was overwhelming with the amount of people that reached out saying they had very similar stories, um, to those bullying stories that I had. And so, I mean, one would be going to middle school homecoming and thinking I was, you know, got, uh, successfully asked a girl out to go with me as my date. Uh, we have this stupid, uh, um, tradition in Texas, which are uh, mums. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of those, but, <laughs> well, but yeah, well, yeah they're, they're ginormous. They're huge. They're huge things, yeah. Ginormous. They're nuts. Like, they, they, they drown every. And now they're even bigger than whenever I was in high school. It was like half your body when I was in high school. Now it's like twice your body. Um, <laughs> Got to bring a wheelbarrow for your mums to prom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I had spent my allowance again all on that and, uh, and took her to the game. And during halftime, uh, another kid named Justin, one of my notorious bullies, walked up uh, into the stands, and we're in the very back far corner. And he comes up and just puts his arm out. She puts her, her arm around his. Her name was Jessica, and uh, and he grabbed the streamer or whatever banner that said Justin and Jessica on it, and said, "Hey, thanks for buying this for my date." Wow. And I was like, "What? She's that's my date." <laughs> and. Uh, turns out that it was just a big setup the whole school i turned around and started looking up at us and um he walked away with her and i kind of got laughed out of there it's cold um and then yeah then it just got worse from there so well and i was and i watched i remember watching that or sorry watching i remember listening to that joe rogan episode listening to it and and i'm gonna i'm a teacher myself and i was heavily heavily bullied as a kid as well and I can look back on my bullying and think that I, I, I processed through it and didn't have depression or suicidal thoughts. But when I listened to your story, I probably, I was probably one of those people that <laughs> gave it a lot of press because I told so many people about that because my bullying stories, are, I would almost assume, are the average bullying stories. But listening to you on Joe Rogan's podcast, I started realizing that when I was listening to it in my car driving, I am a really pacifist kind of guy, pretty laid back and quiet. I felt this like uh, reaction and this drumming up of like violence inside of me that I didn't know really was quite there as I had never heard I've never heard of uh, bullying quite to that extent quite that thought out that you calculating know, calculating evil. it was just it was beyond yeah. what I had heard of before and I, I don't know if it was on that podcast or somewhere else when I was going if that's the kind of thing that you go through or people go through and if they don't take their own life, it's almost like you understand the violence that people who are bullied perpetrate on other people. It's not condoned, but you understand it fundamentally when you hear the level of animosity people have towards you. So, I mean, go back to what Shannon said a minute ago. How did you cope with that? I mean, obviously you were depressed, but how did you ever get past that? To be honest, because I, I admire you for it because I thought I had a hard time, but that is something beyond my comprehension of having to deal with as a kid. Yeah. Well, thanks brother. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think part of the answer is just, I was very fortunate and lucky, um, that I didn't take my own life because I sure, 
I sure as heck wanted to, and I thought about it a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and I, I don't know, just a couple of years ago, my parents owned a photography studio and, you know, it, and these stories, like there was this kid that was just relentlessly bullied, um, in Texas and he was nine years old and my parents were making a memorial plaque for wow. him because he hung himself off his place swing set, um, back in the back of his house. It's insane. Um, and I got to see the frame and see the little boy's picture and it just wrecked me because I was just thinking, you know, that, that could have been me. And I think one of the things that really helped me was I just had a really great mom. Uh, she was incredibly positive, still probably the most positive person I've ever met in my life. Um, when she saw me go through all this stuff, I mean, uh, the, that other story, you know, I, I went to a costume party really wanting to impress this girl and, and, uh, and it, it was her, it was her birthday and I got the invitation and said, you know, costume contest, you know, winner gets a prize and her dad worked at Dr. Pepper and, um, and she loved Transformers. So I made myself into a Dr. Pepper Transformer with <laughs> duct tape and cardboard awesome. boxes. Awesome. It was the most, in my phone right now. It's the most creative, yeah. awesome outfit I've ever heard of. Right. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I, I can't show you because it's on my phone, but I just took a picture at a uh, King Supers or Kroger's, uh, and it was a big display for f- football coming out. And it was like they made this football player doing like the Heisman or something, and it's out of the Dr Pepper cardboard box. <laughs> oh my gosh! I did that before it was before it was cool. Uh, uh, anyways, it, it, I got to that party and um, showed up and went to the backyard and. Uh, Mimi is the one that led me back there, and her grandmother. And yeah, I get, get to the back door, open it up, and I see all my classmates, and they're sitting there, you know, fingers are pointing, Snickers, laughter, a couple of flashes. Um, what are the adults around you doing? And, and, and I just realized I was the only one that dressed up. And Ugh. what are the adults around me? Yeah, no, I mean, just, it was just her grandmother that was there. Oh, okay. Um, Gotcha. Well, well, it was just her grandmother that was there kind of being the chaperone or something. It was like cool kids and she didn't want her parents around or something. And so anyways, uh, I, I got laughed out of there and I actually ran. Well, first, Jennifer said, I can't believe you thought you're good enough to come to my party. Wow. The kid told me you're worthless. And actually, that's the first thing that I heard was you're worthless. And then I heard Jennifer say that. And then after that, Justin, the same kid from the year before, um, said you should just kill yourself and uh that's whenever suicidal thoughts got to like a whole other level i remember running out of there and i, I forget what i shared uh, on that other podcast but um love joe love that you guys are fans of that show and, totally um, I, I i ran to the dairy queen down the street and i was uh literally hiding behind the dumpster and there's like i don't know the the wooden fence that's around it and I had to open that up and hid back there and was just crying until uh, a person came out to throw away trash. Wow. And like, oh, honey, what are you doing? Like, are you okay? Come on inside. And had me come inside and start trying to call my mom. It was before cell phones. And um, and so she, wa- she wasn't answering. She was running errands. Uh, and then eventually she did answer, came and got me. And so my mom saw me go through that stuff after the homecoming uh, game. Um, she saw me that was underneath the stands, the bleachers, crying all by myself, couldn't call my mom. Um, and so she saw me, got me, comforted me, talked to me. She was a safe place for me. Um, and same thing for the Dairy Queen thing, because it's, it's really hard. You, you know, you're, you as a kid, you want to make your parents think, hey, you know, the other kids like me. Right. Uh, you don't, yeah. I remember thinking like every time I had to tell my mom how ashamed I was because it's like, Hey, I'm not the cool kid. Everyone hates me. And I, you know, people are telling me I should kill myself and they think I'm worthless and I feel worthless, you know, but for, for her to just be there and sit there and listen, I had a safe place to open it up and talk to. And I think there's a lot of kids out there that don't have that safe place, um, to be able, or don't feel like it, or maybe the, around the dinner table. And and I, you know, I struggle with this too with my wife, but like, uh, you know, I have to tell myself or, or she has to remind me to put my phone down at right. dinner, you know? And, um, and I think now in today's age, like parents are, you know, have less of a relationship with their kids because they're stuck in their phone and everything else. And the kids don't know that they can open up. I, I know you guys are speakers and, and teachers and different things. And 
uh, I just see kids saying like they, whenever I share this story, they're like, wow, I didn't know someone else was going through this. Right. It's like if, if, if we knew, and if other kids knew that other kids are going through this, then there would be that kind of uh, community of people that could take care of one another and take care of each other. Right. Yeah. That's, and we hope that ahead. that's what, we hope that that's what this show is it, able to give exactly. kids. But you know, your, your mom being able to give you that safe place is amazing and not everybody yeah. has that and she was able to take you back from that brink you still had a hard time with stuff and you oh, still yeah. fell into d- depression that didn't go away explain to me the drug addiction part because was that a coping mechanism for your depression or was that for sure. yeah it was i mean and, and kind of snuck up on me um uh, you know i i had like one time that i drank in high school and that was kind of it and um and then but whenever I, I went straight from high school, cause I was so focused. So, uh, my mom was a safe place, but also wrestling, um, gave me an outlet. It gave me something that I could focus on instead of focusing on what the other kids were saying or, you know, and, and being a wrestler in Texas and it not being a popular thing, uh, you know, kids will be mean and, and, and make fun of you for that and call you gay and all this other stuff just because you're wrestling. And, um, but for me, I, I started to find I only won one match in my first year and a half of wrestling, and I, I only won that. by one point. <laughs> <laughs> so I had coaches that were thinking, you know, they had a meeting, and I was inducted into the Texas Wrestling Hall of Fame or whatever that is. And, wow. And, um, and the coaches talked about it um, because I, I was the only wrestler that won a Greco Roman national championship and different stuff. And so. Um, Congratulations. That's pretty uh, major to, hey. to have that. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a big deal. <laughs> No, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. It's not uncommon with you Iowa boys, uh, <laughs> but it is it is uncommon in Texas. And so um, at that meeting, I remember the coaches saying that they had a, a – and guys raise their hands for who, who was in the meeting whenever the coaches were talking about letting me down easy, saying, you know, Justin is – He's a good kid. He, he likes wrestling, but it's just not his thing. It's not his sport. Like, we should let him down easy and tell him to go focus his effort somewhere else. Wow. Um, but luckily, one coach stood up and said, no, he loves it. And so if it clicks one day, um, then he could really, you know, be great at it. And so I'm, I'm very thankful that coach, Coach Allen Roger. And um, he, uh, he kind of took me under his wing, and he knew some of the stuff that was going okay. on, and he kind of mentored me. Uh, yeah. And so he was the one coach that kind of knew everything I had been through because he he was also that safe place, a mentor. And what I love about coaches is that I think coaches get into it to look for the team or at least the one kid that's really hungry and that really does want to learn, that wants to be coachable and listen to the coach. Um, And so that way – I don't know. So he, he just really invested into my life. And whenever the other coaches tried to, to discourage me or about to, he decided to stand up and say, no, this kid loves it. He's going to, he, if it clicks one day, it's, he's going to be great at it. Um, and so luckily that was, that was pretty much true. And, uh, started a snowball, started winning some state championships and became an all American and national champion. And out of high school, I was one of two guys that went to the Olympic training center and kind of um, I was recruited to Iowa, Iowa State. I went to Iowa State for uh, a, a, a year um, with Kale Sanderson his last year there. Uh, um, but but first, my first place was the Olympic Training Center. And, oh, back to your question of the drug uh, addiction. Um, I think wrestling might have saved me from the depression for a little bit. Uh, but then once wrestling didn't fulfill me or fighting didn't fulfill me or once I got injured – um, it was easy for me to slip back into depression. And whenever I slipped back into depression, I needed surgery and I had to wait for the surgery. And then whenever I finally got the surgery or before I got the surgery, they were giving me Oxycontin and all this, uh, these hardcore, you know, pain pills, uh, right. just to be able to cope, um, with my pain. Cause I, I, I truly needed it then. Um, but then after surgery, again, I truly needed it. I had a knee surgery and an elbow surgery at the same exact time. My right, wow. knee, right, right elbow. Okay, so I think you can see it, oh, yeah. but it's it's from here to here, uh, and I broke, dislocated, and tore the ulnary collateral. Oof. ligament. Ah. I yeah, dislocated it, broke it, tore the ligament, and partially, uh, I, I had a lot of uh, nerve damage uh, in the ulnar nerve, 
now I don't even have a funny bone because it runs down my bicep. And so if I talk on the phone for too long, these three fingers just go numb. Oh, man. Uh, and <laughs> oh, yeah, so they had to take a tendon out of my hamstring and put it in my elbow. Well, I had to wait about four months um, to have that surgery. And the oh. entire time I had, because they wanted to send me to like an ankle doctor uh, for an <laughs> elbow surgery. And I was living huh. at the Olympic Training Center. And I, I'm like, no. And so I had to petition with my insurance company. Anyways, in that time, they were just feeding me pills. Um, wow. Uh, oxy, oxycodone and all sorts of different um, opiates and narcotics. And I just got hooked because I, I loved that it numbed the pain. And I needed that part. Um, but I truly enjoyed and, and I would say loved the, um, the numbing of my depression and um, and I would say that that there was a sense of worthlessness um, because I, I had only about a 30 to 35 percent chance that I'd ever be able to compete again. Oh, well, wow. that was the only thing I'd ever felt um, significance in. Uh, that was the only thing I had ever found self-value or self-worth. And so being told you'd only have a 30 percent, 35 percent chance of competing again, that that uh, I felt like I was. Yeah, I was worthless once again. Now, that was slightly before you competed on The Ultimate Fighter, correct? Yeah. Well, I, actually, it was when I was 19 years old, and I got on The Ultimate Fighter when I was right when I turned 21. Okay. Ah. So, yeah. Uh, but I was hiding that addiction the entire time. My entire fight career, um, until these last two fights, I was, uh, yeah, I was a depressed, drunk, drug addict. Wow. And I just hit it really well for a really long time. Um but the last year, year and a half, I couldn't hide it any longer. So After I got off the Ultimate Fighter, um, it got it got a lot worse, and so I couldn't hide it any longer. So just just out of curiosity, because like I didn't tell anybody about my struggles or my depression. Honestly, I don't think my family even knew until my very first large scale school speaking engagement, and my family was there, and I spilled my guts about my depression, my anxiety, my suicide attempts all that crazy mm-hmm. stuff. And here they are weeping, not knowing anything. So you had yeah. family there, you know, and, and I find that throughout my life still, you know, it, like that's not necessarily the suicidal thoughts, but the depression and anxiety, that's a constant battle. It's an everyday wake up. Like, you know what? You got this today. Life is good. You're going to, you're going to dominate. Do you still approach things that way? I mean, do you still kind of go at it daily? Um, I would say that over the last six and a half years I felt pretty free from it Mm -hmm. Um, but there has been two or three flare-ups of the depression that that kind of hit and kicked in Um, and then I and for me the kind of things that uh, that family can notice friends can notice or that I can notice is and and probably 99% of people with depression go through this but I start to communicate a whole lot less, uh, yeah. stop responding to texts and calls and kind of isolate. And that was really easy for me to do in the mountains in Colorado. I right. just disappear. And I remember my best friend, um, you know, didn't even know I was going through depression at all. We were living in different States after the ultimate fighter. Um, and then I went through a six week long binge, maybe eight weeks actually. Wow. Um, and I don't really remember anything. I traveled to New York City, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Denver, Dallas. Um, and I could see people taking pictures with me on Facebook and stuff and posting and different stuff. But I barely remember any of it because I was such a functioning um, drug addict and, and alcoholic. Wow. And I could just uh, I, I would be the guy that it was terrible. But, um, you know. The next day, ask people, wow, how do we get home? And they look at me with their eyes, you know, (laughs) completely open, like, what? You're the one that drove us. You're the one that walked the line and said, I can drive. And um, it was just terrible. But anyways, my best friend called and I got a voicemail. And he said on the other line, "Um, I can't believe you missed my wedding. I can't believe my best man didn't show up. So, yeah, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, it broke my heart that I hurt the guy that had only loved me, that had helped get my foot in the door of professional fighting. Um, he helped make my childhood dream a reality. Wow. And when my childhood dream became a reality, somehow it turned into this crazy nightmare that I couldn't seem to escape from. And all I was doing, I was just messing everything up and I was hurting people that had only loved me. Um, and so, I mean, I knew I was a hurt dude that was accidentally hurting people, but now I started to hurt people that, 
um, that only loved me, only cared about me, only supported me, uh, had only been a huge encouragement in my life. And all I could return was discouragement um, and pain whenever all they were doing was loving me. That's intense. I'm going to make a big leap, but when you when I think about what you are doing now with the pygmies and water for life and things like that, were I mean, were you involved in that before this time period? During that time period, were you able to look at these people and go, "I thought my life was tough. Look at what these people are going through." Did that have an effect on you at all, or were you in a different place when that happened? I, I was in a completely different place. I never ever thought about doing anything to to help anyone else. I mean, I, I mean, I was a, a decently nice guy. Um, but I never thought about, uh, people overseas or, or, or people in my backyard. I never gave a homeless guy a buck, uh, cause I just thought he'd just go get drugs or drinks on it. Anyways, I never volunteered at children's hospital or youth group or drug rehab or prisons. And now all those things have come to pass. And that that's awesome. Know, once I kind of got freed up of from the addictions and depression and everything else. Like I just kind of had my head on a swivel trying to figure out how I could impact the lives of others. Like my life had been impacted. And so I, um, yeah, I started first at a children's hospital in Aurora, Colorado, the children's hospital there. And, um, and it was incredibly fulfilling, um, just to go hang out with some kids, push them in a wheelchair, uh, help them draw a picture. (laughs) Um, uh, it'd be a goofball, play a video game with them. I mean, it, it became something, I mean, because that opened my eyes up a lot. Like, wow, I was incredibly fortunate, um, incredibly blessed um, to not have ever had to grow up in a children's hospital. Right. And so to be able to see those kids and all the struggles they're going through and to know that those kids are fighters, bigger, better, stronger fighters uh, than I ever uh, was or could ever hope to be, uh, most likely. And so that was incredibly inspiring to me, seeing these kids go through these drastically tough situations. Your life right now revolves around helping people, fighting, and drilling water wells for pygmies <laughs> in the Congo. I don't know how you got from <laughs> being a wrestler in Texas, uh, ultimate fighting, and then you get to the Congo. How did you get to the Congo? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I guess I said that I uh, got to live kind of a, the life of my dreams as a childhood, you know, a childhood dream became a reality. And yeah, I mean, I, I had kickboxed in Amsterdam, wrestled in Moscow, been the main event at the Hard Rock in Las Vegas. Awesome. Um, but that didn't truly fulfill me. I remember getting my hands raised um, and I don't think anyone could find a picture of me smiling after I won a fight. Uh, it didn't matter if it was a big knockout, a big submission, or a hard-fought battle where I had to dig deep and, and pull it out at the last minute, or, and just just somehow I got the victory. And um, it, but I never smiled afterwards. And I, I remember thinking, like, is this it? Uh, when I would get my hands raised, or wow. sometimes I would I would literally think, okay, well, what's next? And so it, the, the, the moment of victory when you're supposed to be celebrating and having a good time, like turned into me celebrating with drugs and alcohol and parties and hoping that would fulfill me and everything else. And then the addiction just tore my life apart and every relationship I had was left in ruins. Oh. Um, not one was successful, not one. Um, and so when my life started to, to get rebuilt, um, and, and I got free from that addiction. I, I, I had that head on a swivel looking for a place that I could get involved in. And, and this, this is taking it to my, my personal side and, and faith. But I just found myself um, at a point in my life where I, I prayed and I said, God, what do you want me to do with my life? Um, and I think I truly meant it. And, and I, I just really wanted to make an impact. And um, this can sound out there. I had, I had experienced uh, and, and uh you know, tinkered around with uh, lots of different kind of hallucinogens and, and, uh, psychedelics. And, um, but this was unlike any of that because I was 11 months sober and I just, I just was lit up and I had a vision and I, it was like a movie in my mind. And I know that can sound nuts. Wow. So yeah, I saw myself in this rainforest. I had no idea where, um, but I was, um, 
walking down this footpath, like literally just such a thick forest of vines and leaves everywhere. And I was pushing those out of the way. And as I got closer, I heard this drumming and I knew I was getting close to a village of some sort. And then I heard this singing very distinct, but like this kind of almost like yodeling. Anyways, I got into the village and there was all this curiosity, but before I got there, but then when I was there, my heart just broke, like literally shattered. And it can sound nuts, but I cried unlike I've ever cried in my entire life. Um, I left a puddle of tears. I Holy mean, that cow. Big, at least a silver dollar size. Um, it was almost hyperventilating crying because I saw these people that were, um, and I thought I was a nut. I thought I was a lunatic. I thought I had some sort of mental break or lapse or uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what happened. But I saw these people that had their ribs poking out and I knew they were hungry. I knew that they were thirsty. They had zero clean water. I knew that they were sick. I knew that they were poor and that they're living in poverty. And I even knew that they were hated and oppressed by the people groups around so much so that I knew that I knew that I knew that they were enslaved and wow. that the people around them. And the thing that just broke my heart was that they felt forgotten, um, forgotten by people, forgotten by God, just forgotten. They were the forgotten people. Um, and all of and that, that happened to you in a vision. Yeah. Yeah. It, it all happened in a vision that I don't know if it was 15 seconds or three minutes but I, but I just, my whole world changed in that moment. And, um, and I know I can sound like a nut and I don't expect anyone to believe me. Um, but I, but it happened, uh, it was, I don't need anyone to believe me. It was, it's that real to me that it's my experience. It's my story. It's, it's, it's what happened. And so much so that it took me three days to work up the courage to tell anybody. Um, but then whenever I told this guy named Caleb, who I'd only met the day that the vision happened. Um, I was like, okay, well, I'm probably never going to see this guy again. I can at least tell him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if he thinks I'm a nut, whatever. <laughs> and so I tell him and he starts kind of like, he kind of flipped out, not in a bad way, a good way. Like he kind of got excited and his head started nodding with me and his <laughs> eyes got big. And I'm like, what? And he said, those are the pygmies. And I said, who? And he goes, they're in the Congo. And I'm like, where? And so it was just nuts. Like he said, those are the pygmies and they're in the Congo. And then he said, I was supposed to go in three and a half weeks. I was going with a group of three other guys. So four of us, but they're all husbands. They're all fathers. And the rebel group just took over the airport and the pygmies are being killed. Not just that, but they're being hunted, killed, cooked, and eaten. And he showed me this United Nations report that was confirming there was some like 30 something cases of cannibalism. He's like, that's where we're going. Um, but, but our wives all are asking us not to go. The United States Department of Defense or Department of State said, uh, said <laughs> for all Americans, don't go into Congo. But even as I asked that, my heart was kind of jumping out of my chest. Like, I got to go. Who are these people? Where are these people? And, and, and why did I see them? And, man, I, even me saying that, I feel kind of like a goober because I know that most <laughs> people listening to this like could just be like – Turning on, turning off their ears, right? You know, you, you mentioned that it kind of seems like you're a goober, and people are probably turning their ears off. But I, I'm going to disagree because, I mean, if you had this vision, and and then it's kind of starting to come to fruition, and there's, I mean, of course, there's all these warnings that you shouldn't go, but there's obviously something, whatever it is, telling you you have got to go. I don't understand. It's, <laughs> uh, it's 4G, and it's all all the bars. Okay, well, and we're not moving, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely me. Yeah, it's all good. I mean, it's, it's no big deal. Don't I, worry about yeah, it. Yeah, we'll, we'll edit it, and we won't keep you for, for too much longer, so no worries. We're kind of yeah. narrowing it down here to, to where we want to go. If, if I could, I, though, I, Justin, I, I would keep you for a couple more hours. Because <laughs> I, I, I'm really, really, one, you're very humble. You started out in a very dark place. Uh, you were like a terrible, terrible place. You were bullied and you were depressed and there was suicidal thoughts and there was drug addiction and you were like bottom of the barrel person, right? But I see that and I see where you come, where you're at now and it is so inspiring. You, you remind me so much of my friend right here, Joshua Colburn. It's uh-huh. just, I think about, I think about you and I think about Josh and it just, it puts a smile on my face I think about what you're doing for other people and just how selfless you are. I love being around people like you because, like Joshua, he, you both give back so much. 
we're not going to be able to hit on everything with the pygmies and the water wells and everything that you're doing. We're definitely going to promote it in the show notes and where people can go to. But where you were at and where you are now with how much you're giving back and going to high schools and helping people realize that no matter how far you are down right now, you can still come out of this. And it might not happen overnight. It might not happen five years from now. But eventually, if you don't give up, you're going to find that passion. Whatever that passion is, you're going to find it and you're going to be successful at it as long as you let yourself be. Yeah, I love that. Thanks a lot for the encouragement, Shane. Well, hey, I had one last, I had a question for Josh, you. Josh, seems like you're a really good dude. Oh, <laughs> he is, thanks. Yeah. He's just talking me up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm kind of a terrible person. He's just really good to me. No. <laughs> no. I do my best. No, he is a good dude. But hey, Justin, I did want to ask you, what does it feel like, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the spiritual aspect of what of where you find yourself. It feels like you really have found your purpose, and there's something much bigger than us. You know, what does it feel like to to be where you are, doing what you're doing, and feeling like you you found your spot in the world? Oh, what does it feel like? Um, man, I would say it's the most rewarding, fulfilling, hardest to put into words um, emotion that I could ever try to comprehend or explain to others um, because it's just been truly uh, amazing. Um, I, I, okay, so this, this might sound nuts, but um, we I, like I nuts. tried to tell someone the other day. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and on the nuts part, three and a half weeks later, after I had that vision, Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm walking with Caleb through the rainforest. I showed him everything I wrote down, hungry, thirsty, sick, oppressed, enslaved. And then at the big top, forgotten, which is where the name fight for the forgotten comes from. Right because, on. Uh, he, the chief pulls us to the side. Whenever we got there, we're walking down a footpath and the drumming's going on. We get closer. The wow. singing's going on. We go in and we meet these people and we see ribs poking out and people with tuberculosis that are sick and kids that haven't had clean water ever and they're dying from it and they're literally like so sick that that you could think like this kid might die to me um and it's just heartbreaking heart-wrenching gut-wrenching and the chief pulls us to the side and i still remember jay law saying like um everyone else calls us the forest people but we call ourselves the forgotten wow and when he said that caleb grabbed my shoulder and i just started to cry again because like the vision happened like it came true and so that set me on this path of like how can i find out who these people are they accepted me as family they call me faosa after i buried a little boy named andy bow wow. um, who died of just dirty water so for me though i mean the three things i want to do is love god love people and push back darkness nice if i can do those three things with my life <laughs> love God, love people and fight the good fight. Um, then, then I can go to the grave with a smile on my face. And so for me though, the sound of them getting clean water, when that, when the chief steps up or a little kid steps up, whoever they choose to, to pump water for the first time, they never have a bucket underneath it. They never have a cup underneath it. I don't know why, but I think they just <laughs> want to see it come out and splash and hit the ground and spray everywhere. Um, but when they do that and it, it hits and that sound, um, for me, I just I just go back to a, a old story of of David and Goliath because like this thing to me was Goliath this this water crisis. It's bigger than Goliath. It's it's a field of giants, and every time a new water well is drilled and that water splashes, and that sound of a ru- that that sound of that splash to me is the sound of the giant collapsing and just hitting the ground. That's amazing. And the dust and like instead of the the water splashing up, it's the dust splashing up from the giant. And then the sounds of the cheers of the village, like that to me is the sound of the army just celebrating the victory. And so, I don't know. To me, that's the closest thing I can think of to that that story in my own life. Uh, like it's that, not fighting a dude in a cage. It's it's seeing water. Sp- that just gave me chills. Like, yeah, that was it, awesome. It made me all, all funny, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no joke. Yeah, that's like, awesome. Uh, what I was going to say earlier is that I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud, but if you go back and you need someone, give a call. Because I want to go. I want to check it out. I want to be a part of that. I think it's unbelievable. And I know that's probably crazy of me to say, but I'm not joking. As he said, like, money where my mouth is, no joke. But to dive in to the Fast Thank Five. You, yeah, of course, man. And I'm not kidding. Like, you got my contact info. We'll do this. Yeah. So 
Go ahead. That's pretty intense. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> <It is> intense. <laughs> um, the Fast Five, we do this I, every show. I haven't show. heard an interviewer tell me that yet. <laughs> well, and, and I'm not Good joking, stuff. man. Like I said, yeah. put me on a plane, send me there. I'll shake your hand on that soil. Um, but, yeah, so Fast Five, we do this every show. It's just quick top-of-mind stuff. They're fast questions, and we okay. just want you to kind of roll off the tongue with what you got. You ready? Okay. All right. Super salad. Soup. <laughs> <laughs> He-Man or Optimus Prime? Uh, He-Man. Whoa, after being a Transformer. No, totally we'll see, the Transformer yeah, thing was like backfired. a... Yeah, ah, <laughs> I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. I wouldn't like the fucking Transformers either. <laughs> your yo, your most used phrase? Because my most used phrases are like right on or for sure. I say those things a lot. What's yours? H- head on. I think it's uh, head on a swivel. I, head on a swivel. That one. That one. I've probably said three or four times. This one. You yeah, got it. Yeah, it was three or four times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's what I feel like I'm always looking at. I I've had ADD since I was 13. Oh wow. And it's funny because there's a book out that's called uh, something about uh, being a hunter in a farmer's world and how modern uh, modern day has made so much for the farmers. Right. And I, I just always feel like I'm the hunter, and so I'm always looking. I'm, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, head on a swivel is like a very uh, law enforcement or military term, too. You know, right, keep your head yeah. on a swivel, keep yeah. yourself safe, your boy's yeah. safe. So it's crazy. All right, so one piece of advice you wish you could give your 18-year-old self. I think I would have told myself to live to love. That's how I signed my book. Uh-huh. Um, it's live to love, love to live. I think I was always focused on me. And when I, yeah, anyways, uh, yeah, live the love because it, it, for instance, how you said, whenever I, I see the pygmies and all their suffering, like I used to just see my suffering and it would, it was just magnified. It was all I could see. It was so close. It was like blinders were on. All I could see was my own problems. But whenever I finally decided to live a life to love, to love others, um, my problems became very almost microscopic while I saw theirs. Um, and so many other people that were facing so much more stuff that was so much tougher than I was or ever could dream or imagine or fathom unless I decide to put myself in those um, situations and scenarios with them. And so that's what I've discovered is if I can live to love, I'll love to live. But it, but everyone has that backwards. We all just want to love the life that we live. And and I think that that always almost leads to, to disappointment, depression drugs absolutely yeah the, the the more i focus on my negativity the worse off i am but the more that i give in those moments to someone else man it fills me up with everything positive it gives me purpose i i would agree 100 percent with what you're saying that's amazing for sure all right last one where can people find out what you're yeah, up to thanks, what's next where you're headed okay what's uh what where what, where is the best place um yeah so if if if, if People are into social media, Instagram, Twitter, um, at the big pygmy. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, my fight name used to be the Viking, but now it's the big pygmy. Awesome. So that's the big pygmy on social media. Yep. For, uh, Justin Wren. Thank you so much for being on the show. Super amazing. Like seriously, I wish we could have dived, dove, dived, dived, dove, do- in. dove in to, more of his time at the in the Congo and like his experiences there and all that, but I'm not gonna lie. Like, I think he was the first person that really dove in depth to the to the impacts of bullying and yeah. the drugs and all that. Which it was good to. I kind of feel like we stewed there a little bit, but I feel like that's no. good in some ways. I think that's a great thing because we that's the part that we're talking about on this show. Right, we've got to stew in that, you know. And and I think I shouldn't say it's easy, but it's good to focus on the things that he's done with his life since then. And like you said, Shane, that he's moved on and he's found purpose in his life from those deep dark places. But I think it's good to understand what you're going through. You're not alone in what you're going through. It can be really, really bad, and you can still come out of it. Because like I said, I've never heard anything like the bullying that he's gone through and that he is alive or that he didn't harm somebody else is a pretty amazing thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm i just kind of at a loss for words because I've already said how inspiring he is to me personally, but um, it would be really cool if you were able to set something up and go with him to the Congo. Yeah. That w- I would love to hear yeah, about that. Would- like, I'm not even kidding. Like, if that opportunity arose, it scares the shit out of me. Like, it sca- how could it not? I mean, knowing what he's been through, what, like, if I had malaria, like, three yeah. times, and, like, mm-hmm. just the 
it it will probably mentally screw with me the rest of my life if I go, but I think that's part of the reason that I said I would do it is because of that adventure, because of the fulfillment I see he gets, that we kind of have that similar viewpoint. And I'm sorry, you, you're not here talking to him just for by happen chance. There's a reason right. why these things happen, as far as I'm concerned. Sure. And if that means that you need to go do that, that means you were introduced to him in this way for a purpose. Done. I'd agree. Listen to you. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not very, I'm not a very religious person, or I, I'm, I'm spiritual but not religious. If that makes sense sure. to people who are listening, but uh, I, I don't hold any of that against him. And when he's talking about that, whatever gets you to the point to where you're super happy, God bless. And you're yeah, doing your life. Totally. I mean, and, and if you got, find yourself in a position of truly giving your of your life all the time. Uh-huh. I mean, come on. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Now, there are a few things that I wanted to bring up, and I wish uh, we had a little bit more time with him, but we're going to have we're gonna do a part two. Yeah, we got to do a yeah, part two. Do a he part said two. he would. Right. Hold awesome. on to it. Uh, but there, Definitely. I will have a link in the show notes below about his Kickstarter documentary. Um, it's about fighting freedom. Uh, they have a film crew that follow him through the Congo and with the... Uh, the pygmies there, so I wanted to bring that up. Uh, people can click on that link and go to the Kickstarter. Actually, I think the Kickstarter campaign itself is over with, but you can watch the the trailer for the documentary. And again, it, it's one of those things where you have. I think you have to see it, or you have to. I mean, seeing it via a movie is probably the closest mo- most anybody's going to get to it besides just going there right. and experiencing it. So, your Josh. Uh, yeah, I would tef- definitely check out uh, the Kickstarter documentary. Again, the link will be below. Also, go to water for water for the number four, dot yep. org, um, and that is where you can find all the stuff on uh, Justin's stuff. There's uh, he's all, wait 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 all, all the, the stuff, stuff on Justin's, Justin's stuff. stuff. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> That's really all, well spoken. All the are stuff on are you a podcaster? Because you're yeah. so good at it. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, he has and, a book, and and it was waterfor.org slash fight for the forgotten. So there, so people yes, can go exactly. direct. Yeah, go so, direct. Yeah, so you can get we'll get his stuff direct. through his stuff through that <laughs> website and stuff. So we got it. <laughs> Moving on, sir. No, that was that was pretty much it. Thank you for bullying me. Was, oh, <laughs> oh, you know that's not what the show's about. No, it's it's show's all about. in good fun, it's well, and we is. will cuddle after. Well, raise a radio. I like that's to right. cuddle during. <laughs> well, why are you sitting over there? That's why we edit. We don't do anything live. We just. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would say it wasn't as creepy this time. Definitely oh, wasn't no, as creepy. No. I mean, Justin has. Beautiful golden locks. No, I know that. I know I could see the stars in your eyes during the whole conversation. <laughs> Was it that apparent? Oh, uh, yeah, but it's fine. It's okay. It's if, fine. I, if I ever were to like, actually nest. see him in person, I'd probably clam up. <laughs> Look, hi, just a little fanboyish. Uh, yeah, I yeah, fanboyed very. the crap out of the Candace episode. I get it. I thought you so, held yourself together. Did, was really? It all right? Yeah, oh, I felt like I, I thought you did a good job. You did no, you did good. You did. You did. No, super. you weren't embarrassing. Okay. No. I mean, I'm embarrassed for you, but you weren't embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. I feel the that, same way. Simon okay. Sanborn. What you do you got coming up? What do you got going on? If you go to tpsmedia.co, you can follow us. Uh, all the podcasts that are on there. Well, it is Radio. Well, Razor Radio being the number one on there. Then there's a Primal Scream podcast. There is the Bandwagon podcast. There's a bunch of things on there that we're doing through our company uh, via podcast and a bunch of things coming online. So they're kind of new, exciting, fun things that are happening. So I'm pretty stoked about it. Exciting and new. new. The Love Boat theme. Wow. It's 1986 (laughs) up in here right now. (laughs) Yeah. And at tpsmedia.co, if you are an author and you would like to have your uh, jewel, this beautiful creation that you've put on paper or in your computer. If you want that turned into an audiobook, you and, by, per- and by Jewel, you mean book? Yes. Okay, I'm just making sure, just <laughs> clarifying. Yeah, just clarifying. I'm clear too. Yeah, go ahead. all right. So if you've written a book and you'd like to have an audiobook <laughs> created, go to tpsmedia.co and you can peruse our fem- female and male voices and then you just, you know, click and submit and we have a conversation. Yeah, nice. Bada bing, bada boom. Nice. So, the, like so then, I feel, so then, I feel kind of we kind of knock your dick in the dirt tonight. I'm, I apologize. Yeah, I, I like you a lot. You're a good person. Agree. <laughs> but I, I want to do it just a little bit more and make the statement that if you create a written jewel, you can turn it into an audio jewel here. Oh, so you're making audio jewels. 
We're making audio jewels for your ears. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. So this is good. I, I'm liking this. All right. It's terrible. This is terrible media. This no, is not good. good. This is good. People listening, I have no apologies for what's happening. <laughs> Thanks for joining Joshua us. Joshua Coburn, so, what's going on with you? What's going uh, what's next for you? Are you are you traveling? Are you You speaking? know what? I, I got a bunch of schools coming up around the Midwest, which I'm pretty pumped about doing the well raising across the nation. Nice. Manners Motivation Events, so that's exciting. So a lot of schools coming up. Uh, if you want me at your school, um, tell your like legit. Tell your parents, tell your uh, principals and administrators you want me there, and they'll reach out. Tell them how awesome it is that I would be there, and uh, we'll make it happen. No joke. I'll come see you. Otherwise, uh, per usual, um, JoshuaCobra.com for more episodes. Well Razor Radio, uh, everything for the Relief and Resource Center if you're struggling, and of course. More episodes, uh, hopefully coming soon. But if you want to check out the past episodes, not on my website, you can hit up iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and again, plug, plug, JoshuaCoburn.com. Um, <laughs> y'all right there? <laughs> Am I, what? What's no, wrong? No, I love you. I just I miss <laughs> I miss you, and I love you. And it's been a while since we've had these podcasts, so I feel like everything you say, I just I'm giddy about. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right, I'll take it. I'll take it. So, so anyway. A big thanks to Mr. Justin Wren for joining us. Yeah, it was yeah, awesome. Absolutely. And uh, stuff. thanks to all of you guys for listening, because without you guys, there would be no Well Razor Radio. And uh, to these two yahoos sitting next to me, I appreciate you guys so much. And lastly, here at Well Razor Radio, there is... No judgment. Just kindness. Boom. Thank you very much. Talk soon, guys. Later. Later.